Hi, and welcome to the first episode of Keeping Contact, your netball show on Nine's Wide World of Sports digital platforms. I'm your host, my name is Liz Ellis, and joining me is Diamond Superstar, former Australian netball team captain, Laura Geitz. Geitz, it's great to have you joining me today, and uh, what have you been up to in isolation? Hi, Liz. It's nice to um, it's nice to have some social activity in these isolation days, isn't it? I've um, I've actually just discovered that I'm quite a keen green thumb. So I've just finished um, some veggie patches, and it's also a great way of um, getting the the boys out outside and entertained to a certain degree as well. All right. Well, I think uh, in in weeks to come, you and I might need to have a little bit of show and tell from our, our veggie patches. I'll bring some zucchini next week. I think. Oh, I love that. And we might we might just have to add there that you're probably hailing from some of the most fertile ground. We should even consider maybe, who knows, this show might morph into more of a, a Burke's backyard than a netball show. <laughs> <laughs> they might consider who, who's hosting after <laughs> after a few episodes. Oh, Guts' his backyard. And Liz's cellar. There we go. We <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll be matching wine and food by the end of it. Netball, I don't know what you're talking about. Now, this is a netball show, as you say, and sadly, COVID-19 has affected all levels of netball, from the Diamonds to uh, Suncorp Super Netball, right down to the grassroots. Unfortunately, we're not spending Saturdays uh, watching our favourite teams, whether it's our under-8s team or our Suncorp Super Netball teams, go around. Uh, Gaiti, with this, all, this disruption, can you see a way forward for netball? What do you think we're going to look like at the end of all this? Oh, it's such... It's such uncharted territory isn't it I mean no one's been in this position before so no one can can lend experience or advice to to any of the players coaches administrators grassroots whatever level um, I think really when you do look at the elite level the girls have essentially completed a pre-season to head straight into an off-season which obviously creates a lot of frustration for them but you know, we can sit here and say how disruptive it is, and it is, but at the same time, it's a really good opportunity to look at the positives, and there are a lot of positives. I think there's ways of engaging with one another that we never knew before, and in terms of seeing a season, what it will be like, is it going to be a shortened format? Is it going to be like a World Cup, a Commonwealth Games format? I mean, um, you know, there is still an extended period of time before decisions have to be made. So fingers crossed something does happen. Um, and for the sake of the girls, I mean, you know, we, we want to see our, our favourite players out there on court. Absolutely. Well, there might not be any Suncorp Super Netball on or any Diamonds games to be played. But our netballers still have a very impressive social media game, Laura. They've put you and I to shame. They've put up all sorts of Speak things. Speak for yourself, Liz. I know I'm happy to speak for both of us compared to what the girls are doing. There's Zoom training sessions, there's all sorts of things going on on TikTok. Let's have a look at what they've been up to. Maybe we can make it last. Pain pills, maybe we should make it blast off. Maybe we can 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 make it blast off. All right, some terrific stuff there, and it's great to see the players have been keeping busy. Now, one player who has been super busy is the person who is the president of the Players Association. She's also busy growing uh, a bit of a bumpy belly, and that is, of course, Nat Medhurst. Nat, welcome to you. Great to see you. Some big news this week um, through the Players Association is that the, the pay cut that the players have taken has uh, been capped now at 50% rather than 70%. Can you talk us through what that means? Uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, obviously, initially, the players had all agreed to the 70% pay cut, and that was prior to JobKeeper coming in. And then when that came in, um, we then looked at all the figures and we actually, you know, realised that clubs could actually potentially be one in a better position, but also the players. And we just felt that there was too much of a discrepancy between the lower earning players who possibly could have come out ahead um, and then I think the highest paid earner was going to end up taking a 68% pay cut. So um, we spoke or proposed to Netball Australia around capping it at 50%. Um, they also 
save money as well with this new arrangement. So it's a bit of a, a win-win on both both fronts. And I think um, certainly for the playing group to take a 50% pay cut for some players compared to what was looking like 70, um, yeah, is certainly a lot, a lot nicer. And we're obviously, we don't know whether or not we will go to full pay at any point. So we're just waiting to see how things continue to unfold over the coming weeks and months. Nah, it's um, obviously uncharted territory for everyone involved in the game. What's the messaging that you give, particularly to the young players and the players in general about the delay, delay in the start to the season? Yeah, it's sort of um, a tough one, to be honest, because there's finding that fine balance between, well, do you keep your skills up? Because and obviously for young players as well, off-season, and this is kind of another off-season in some parts, that's where they make their biggest gains and their biggest improvements. But you also need to mentally, I guess, get away from netball because we have no idea how long this is going to go to. I think we have until basically Christmas to be able to try and play out a season. So um, the biggest thing is, I think, staying on top of their well-being. Um, that's been the biggest thing that has just been communicated across the board from day one um, is making sure that, you know, they keep talking to people where they can. I know clubs are staying engaged with their playing group as much as possible. Um, yeah, and just making sure that they know who the support people they have around them um, because I think it's that uncertainty for all the players that, and I mean for everyone everywhere, um, that's certainly causing a lot of stress and anxiety and really impacting their well-being. And I think at the end of the day, the individuals and the clubs that can handle this the best are going to probably come out when we do perform. They're going to perform the best as well. So um, that's certainly been the biggest one and um, try as hard as possible to stay sane without turning to the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a little and, bit difficult. Um, yeah, just keep engaging with each other with whatever way that you can. And I saw on social media the other day, not only playing basketball, but you're also completing conditioning sessions, making those that were on the couch eating potato chips at 21, <laughs> nine weeks, feeling exceptionally guilty. Is there a comeback on the cards? Um, yeah, I'm not too sure what I was thinking there. I'm going to blame baby brain. It makes you do all weird and stupid things. So um, that's my reason for that. It took me a while to recover. But um, yeah, to be honest, when all this stuff sort of happened and um, the first talks around the season possibly starting in July, it was something that did cross my mind um, and continues to do so. I think the coaches were onto it even before I was and they said, you know, you've got to have a natural birth. You shouldn't have a C-section because... <laughs> There's, um, you know, six weeks recovery or whatever it is. So um, they're trying to pull all the strings. But, yeah, I have, I have no idea. Um, you know, it obviously is something that's sort of dangling there a little bit. And at the end of the day, uh, my baby's due in July. So, um, you know, that the health of that little one and, and obviously my own is going to be the priority. And who knows, I might never want to look at a netball court ever again. But, um, yeah, we'll certainly see how it all plays out and... Um, there might be a chance that I'll be there or I'll just continue to um, cheer from the, from the sidelines with the baby somewhat attached to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Matt, you are the queen of timing, great timing on the court. You may very well be the queen of great timing off the court. It may very well work out that we get to see you play this year. Good luck for the remainder of the pregnancy and looking forward to seeing a new baby girl called Liz Laura at the end of it. <laughs> I'll add it to the list, guys. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> oh, look, guys, I don't mind if she goes Laura Lees. I'm quite happy with that as well. But interesting, isn't it, to hear about Nat talking about the players. I, would, I think I'll, I would have struggled to have two pre-seasons in a season, especially as I got older. One pre-season was enough for me. How do you think you would have coped? Yeah, it's a really interesting one. I mean... What Nat also mentioned was, you know, just having that time away from the game. It is so busy for particularly the international girls as well. So this is a perfect opportunity for them to just take a step back, do all the things that we always say we're too busy to fit into when we're, you know, in, in the season. So a great time for them just to engage with their families and, and have some time away from the sport. So I reckon selfishly I would be loving this time. I'd be putting the toes up, Liz. I can say that now. I'm not in it. Uh -huh. You're such a liar as you. you be out punching on and running and all that sort of stuff. But look, it is fascinating. We do thank Nat for her time.
So you're right, Gatsy, though. I, I do think that, you know, this is difficult for some people, this isolation, not being able to work. There are some people are going through some tough times, but there are some interesting silver linings going on. Now, the next silver lining I do want to talk about is a terrific partnership between Netball Australia and Netflix. So they've teamed up to keep uh, all levels of players, from grassroots to junior reps to elite players involved in coaching clinics. Let's take a look at what they're doing. Let's go. Dodge, dodge, kick up the ball. Yes. Good work, hey. So make sure you're getting angles right now. My core switched on the whole time. Awesome work. One, one two. Give it a shot, hold. Three, two, one. Go. Well, I have the quote of inhale courage, exhale oh, fear. That's... Netfit and Netball Australia working together to keep netballers engaged, even though they can't quite see each other. Well, we're really fortunate now, speaking of Netball Australia, to be joined by, I was going to say the CEO, but that's a bit boring. She really is the <laughs> innovator in chief, Marnie Fechner. Marnie, it's great to have your company. You've been at Netball Australia for 15 years. Can you just walk us through um, or describe to us what this COVID-19 has, the impact that it's had on the organisation? Yeah, look, um, thanks, thanks, Liz, and thanks for that lovely introduction. It's um, always nice to be known as something other than the CEO. But uh, yeah, look, it has had, COVID-19 has been an absolutely extraordinary experience. We've, um, I don't think we've ever seen anything like it in our time in the sport. There's no netball. Um, and that's a really, really strange place to be. There's none of our elite netballs in training to prepare for Suncorp Super Netball. And I'm not spending my Saturdays at the local netball courts with my girls. So it's quite eerie. Um, and, you know, it's, it's had a massive impact uh, across the ecosystem of our sport. Marnie, I think the question on everyone's lips is what steps are Netball Australia taking to potentially get um, Suncorp Super Netball up and running again? Yeah, look, it's, it's a really good question. And I think where we're at at the moment is in, in the depths of scenario planning where we're talking to government, we're talking to our, our clubs who are really critical to this, our players association and our commercial partners because all of them are going to have to put their shoulder to the to the wheel to help us get this back up and running. So at the moment, it's really important to understand when borders are likely to open up. It's highly unlikely that we're gonna see fans at our games this year, which is which is a strange thing for us. We love, we love to perform in front of our, our, our favourites. So we're looking at the scenarios, we're modelling those out, uh, and we're working really closely with our broadcast partners who uh, are gonna be really bring this, to, bring this to life for us. So I think that's where we're at. We're hoping, as we um, have, have indicated, that by the end of May, we'll be in a really great position uh, to let our fans know and our athletes know when, when this thing's going to pop back up again. You mentioned there the, the clubs at a grassroots level. How are, how are the associations coping? Mm. Look, I think our, our grassroots community is so robust. It, it, our community sport, no matter what sport, um, lives on the back of amazing volunteers who give their time and coaches, administrators, umpires to make this, uh, to bring this game to life. And I think that they're, they're sad. I think that they're not able to, to be at their, their home, um, their spiritual home on a Saturday or a midweek to, to play the game that they and participate in the game that they love. So I think what they're, they're anxiously waiting um, and preparing uh, for the game to come back to life uh, for, in whatever shape that is. And I think that that's the really, that's the unknown at this point in time where we're seeing some restrictions uh, across uh, states lift is really positive but our plan for how we return to the game um, on a Saturday where we might have 30 courts um, and hundreds and thousands of kids um, playing netball uh, probably won't be like that for a little while Laura. Marnie can you, will, can you, do you have a gut feeling will grassroots netball happen this year? Oh, I've got a oh. road hanging on there absolutely hang on everyone <laughs> to say right now. <laughs> I know um, I think I said um, in an interview early uh, last week uh, that I do think community netball will be back up and running this year. And, and I think that perhaps we might, they might, that might be our green shoots 
start to see that happening. Um, it'll look different, uh, but I do think that we'll see it happening. And uh, I'm hoping that associations, that even associations that are used to playing in winter months actually will be innovative and creative and work with their member organisation and their state body to really find ways to, to get the game back up and going, even if it's not in that traditional window that um, a, num a number of us are used to. All right, there's a number of people, including my daughter, doing a happy dance right about now, which yeah. is good news. Just uh, before we let you go, I know you've got a heap of things on, but um, what are the opportunities for the sport out of this? Look, I, I think that there's, like every sport, there's an opportunity for us to, to look at how we do things and, and, and look at and just ask ourselves, is this fit for purpose? Is it serve, does it serve us well? I think we've... But what we've experienced is a, a really a fast tracking our digital approach and, and being much more proactive in a digital environment. Our NetFit partnership meant that kids could actually undertake some netball skills and drills, but at home in a, a really different environment. So I think that what we'll learn from this is how the sport is going to need to change, how we're going to evolve to be um, sustainable again. I think that it'll, it'll take some time for us to get back to that point and get the community back up and running so I don't have any specific um, specific place to land there Liz but I think that we, we are looking at how we actually come out of this in a more robust shape um, and make sure that we're ready to grow um, as a sport and ensure that we remain the number one women's sport in this country. All right Marnie thank you so much for your time good luck for the next few months and looking forward to see what netball looks like at the end of all this. Oh, thanks Liz and Laura really great to speak to you. Terrific to hear there from Marnie Fechner and to see really that uh, Netball Australia are working behind the scenes to get us our elite level netball, but importantly, our grassroots level netball kicking off. So good luck to them in those endeavours. Now, one of the players who has stood out this week from Suncorp Super Netball as doing something a little different is the Swift's Lauren Moore. This young superstar decided last year after visiting some kids who were suffering from cancer and the Kids Cancer Project is the Swift's charity partner. She decided to put her hair where her mouth is or her money where her hair is or something along those lines. Uh, so essentially this week she shaved her head and her aim was to raise $10,000 for shaving her head. She's well over that now. Uh, and Laura, what a magnificent thing to do. It just gave me such a smile in the age of COVID. These, these kinds of people are the incredible characters within our game. So Lauren has, you know, the fact that she's just done this is, is no small feat. You know, obviously when she did see those kids in the hospital, it had a huge impact on her and it's very easy. There's been a lot of players in that position to walk away and, and probably, you know, feel sorry, but to, to carry it on and do something really purposeful is amazing. And for her to raise the amount of money that she has is just sensational. So um, it makes you really proud as a as a player of the game to, to sit back and say these are the kinds of girls that are, are now carrying the baton, which is just incredible to see. Yeah, and going back to talking to Nat Medhurst, Lossie Moore, she's not one of, you know, the superstars of the Swiss. She's not a Helen Housby or a Sam Wallace. She's not in the Australian team. She's one of the players who's on a minimum contract, yet here she is thinking not about herself, losing 70% yeah. of her pay. She's lost 50% of her pay, but for her, last Friday, it was all about Getting, getting a hair off, raising the money and giving something back to the community. I'm slightly jealous that she doesn't actually have hair to wash in these <laughs> days anymore. <laughs> you know, I, I, I reckon I, she'll I, keep I, it I, shaved. I, yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine how good that will be? So well done, Laura. Oh. She's played it so well on every level. Now, people who have may not have played it so well on every level are uh, my guests or my host co-host today is Laura Gutch, <laughs> Shani Layton, Kath Cox and me. We've been involved in something called the Fantasy Draft. So every week we've been getting together and trying to choose players to make up our own team. So uh, we're two rounds down so far. The next round is out tomorrow. So you need to make sure you've got your eyes out on digital for that to get put up. Fair to say, Laura, you've got a pretty good looking team. We'll have a look at your team now. What are you making of it? Oh, the grunters, I'm, I'm particularly happy with um, how the grunters are faring at the moment. Um, I think not to give too much away, but um, obviously your team, Lizzie's Lockdown Legends and the Grunters are yet to name their wing defence. And there was a fair bit of controversial 
comments over that wing defence position. Um, and, you know, obviously you and I, I can say that we were after the same, the same girl and um, you'll have to tune in just to make sure you find out who won the battle there. <laughs> This is true. I'm going to say, though, I went after the first round, I went to, like, there's nothing like being an ultra competitive person uh, as we are. And I went to bed that first week and I, my first two choices were Greta Buetta and Lizzie Watson. But when I did that, I was desperate to get that combination going, but it let you have Carla Pretorius. And I spent the whole next week going <laughs> as I was lying in bed at night. Bloody shouldn't have let Guy have Carla Pretorius. <laughs> I was, I, I was, I was... I was like a, fa I was fangirling when Carla Pretoria sent me a message on social media saying that she was stoked to be a part of the Grunters. And then I didn't think life could get much better. And then I received a message from Langman saying the same thing. So not to gloat or anything, but you know, <laughs> I'm happy my, I'm happy two of my stars are, are happy with, um, with their position on the Grunters, that's for sure. Kat Cox, Gotta say, she doesn't have any regard for defenders. If we have a look at her team, her team is all the front line. Let's hope they score off every centre pass because she's going to take what's left over when it comes to defence. And I don't know that Shani really had any strategy. She had to. <laughs> the, the fact, the fact that we were discussing the that she was select selecting on hair colour is a concern really, isn't it? So yeah. um, look, at least Shani will be bellowing from the sidelines. And I think if you're a player on her team, you, you'll be scared into doing the right thing purely by the tone of her voice. That is true. All right, so the next episode of Fantasy Draft drops tomorrow. Don't miss it. Now, even though there's no netball on, there is still netball on. It's 3 p.m. on Saturday. There is a watch party. So we're going to go through every weekend and take a look at some big games from each round of 2019. They'll be on Saturday at 3 p.m. on Facebook. This week, it's a big game from round one, 2019. The Swifts taking on the Giants. It was a massive grudge match. Plenty of feeling in it. Maddie Proud uh, and Jamie Lee Price will be joining me. We'll be chatting away through it. If you want to join in, on Facebook. We'll be answering your questions. There might be a few sledges going on. Let's hear a little bit from Maddie Proud about that game. Hey guys, I hope you're all pumped to watch the Swifts versus Giants round one match this Saturday. I still remember that game like it was yesterday. It was my first as captain, the first of the season. We were all so nervous, but we were so excited. It was your typical Sydney Derby. It was a packed stadium. There were momentum shifts that went back and forth. It was tough. It was physical. There were bodies flying everywhere. And to this day, it was probably one of my favourite games that I've played in. Um, I think it really set the Swifts up for the rest of the season. Obviously, it was great to end up on top. Um, and I hope you guys enjoy watching it as much as I enjoy playing in it. Go Swifts. All right, we'll see you at three o'clock on Saturday for that classic Sydney derby. Can't wait. Get into your Facebook account and we'll have some great chats. Laura, guys, thank you for joining me for the first episode uh, of Keeping Contact. What have you got up, coming up this week? Thank you very much for having me, Liz. I look forward to next week when we um, can compare our fresh produce. <laughs> and our fantasy draft teams, of course. All right, have a great week.